In 1943, a sparsely populated farming community in East Tennessee was transformed almost overnight into a secret military industrial complex. The purpose? To help usher in the nuclear age and end World War II. The place was called Oak Ridge, and in only a few short years, it would become the home of a massive nuclear complex that would contribute mightily to world peace. Gaseous diffusion, calutrons, and thermal diffusion processes were built to enrich uranium. The X-10 graphite reactor demonstrated the ability to produce plutonium using a uranium reactor. Nearly 100,000 patriots helped make the materials for atomic weapons that would end the war. After the war, enrichment continued and expanded, and Oak Ridge became the world supplier of enriched uranium for manufacturing commercial nuclear fuel. Thirteen nuclear reactors were built at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the lab became an authority on nuclear energy and reactor training. ORNL scientists demonstrated how to separate isotopes and led the way for nuclear medicine, which has saved millions of lives. Y-12 expanded its operations and ultimately played a major role in winning the Cold War. Today, Oak Ridge continues to build its legacy as a leader for world peace and modern science. In the past 30 years, Oak Ridge has also become a leader for environmental cleanup. Even before the rest of the nation began cleanup in earnest, Oak Ridge was already hard at work laying the groundwork for their part in DOE's largest, most challenging cleanup program. Before 1970, each state was primarily responsible for protecting its own air, water, and soil. However, through the 70s, the environmental consciousness of the country was growing and gaining traction, and the federal government was beginning to pass important laws. In 1970, the National Environmental Policy Act was passed and became the springboard for formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. In 1976, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, also known as RECRA, was passed. In 1980, the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA or Superfund, became law and provided the authority for federal agencies to address their cleanup problems. With these laws in place, the regulating community was preparing to carry out its responsibility for air, water and soil protection. The possibility of suspension or shutdown of Oak Ridge operations loomed. In 1983, the environmental movement as we know it today was born under the leadership of Joe Legrone, then the Department of Energy's manager of Oak Ridge operations. Having done a crash course and what the problems were, air, water, soil, RICRA was on the horizon. I got in my car and drove over and visited with Governor Lamar Alexander for about an hour. Had one of our senior people visit with Jim Word, who at the time was running TDEC, told him that we were going to change the way things were being done. I drove to Atlanta, talked with the regional administrator and some of his key people, and told him the same thing. I told him that what I wanted to do and told Governor Alexander what I'd like to do would be to start periodic meetings among the most senior people in the state DOE here and down in EPA Region 4 so that we could talk about status of issues, problems, progress, and so forth. And that beneath that wanted to form teams that would be made up of DOE contractor staff and regulator staffs who would meet and talk about issues, initiatives, requirements, and what have you. Not to work the issues through the newspapers and throw rocks, but rather to sit at a conference table and work as professionals or get out better yet and walk some of these sites. So that, you could say, was the beginning, the birth of the environmental cleanup program as we know it today in the Department of Energy was born here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 1983. Under Joe Legrone's leadership, consent orders were agreed to. The gates of the operating facilities were opened to regulators. Citizens' oversight groups were formed and the environmental movement began and spread. There was no EM program in those years. So what you did, you did on your own or you did nothing. Between 1983 and 1989, we put in a, almost $2 billion that we took from here and we took from there. 
We got some friendly slaps on the wrist from people in Congress, but there were people on the Hill, particularly staffers, that I had known for a lot of years who understood what we were trying to do and the vitality of keeping these things going. RICRA and its applicability to the Department of Energy was being contested at that time in a lawsuit called Leaf versus Hodel. The decision on that was not rendered until about mid-1984. Mind you, jump back, this is April of 1983. So there were some slings and arrows that came toward Oak Ridge from various places within the department that, quote, Legron had given in to the regulators that I was a tree hugger, and my retort was, one of these days you guys will be trying to climb that same tree, and you'll be trying to pull me out of it because you're going to find that your sins are going to catch up with you and the high water is going to be there. And not being a prophet or a seer, but that's exactly what did happen. One of the first examples was the contamination in the East Fork of Poplar Creek. There were two things in particular being discussed. One was a disagreement between the Department of Energy and the state of Tennessee about East Fork Poplar Creek. The department contended that it was an industrial ditch, whereas the state of Tennessee, which had delegation from EPA Region 4 to cover water, contended that it was a fresh water stream. So one of the first things that I did was to go down to New Hope Pond, which at that time was a catchment basement, and East Fork Poplar Creek went into it, and I walked from there up to the headwaters of East Fork Poplar Creek and found a spring. I grew up in the swamp country of Louisiana and Texas, and I know the difference between industrial ditches and springs, and I declared on the spot that it was a fresh water stream, and I could hear the gasp of many behind me. I walked back down that thing, and as I walked, I saw all these funny little ports and holes and things going into it, and I later asked the question, what are those? And I was told, those are discharge points. As a matter of fact, there were about 222 unpermitted discharge points into East Fork Poplar Creek. In 1983, the state of Tennessee posted advisory signs warning the public that East Fork Poplar Creek was contaminated. When the Mercury story came out, there was all kinds of stories and attributions and blame and finger pointing and so forth. We took the approach where we're not going to go into blame. It's easy to blame. We were going to fix the problem. The other thing that we decided to do at the beginning was we were going to fix the problem at the point source origin of the pollution, whether it was water, whether it was a stack, or whether it was barrel, or whatever. There's no use in going down here and cleaning up a pond and continuing to generate waste that come into it. So we began work on all those discharge points at Y-12. We also worked on the coal pile at Y-12. We closed with the permission of the state New Hope Pond. And we got on the drawing boards, what I named as Lake Reality. But I thought that beyond hope, you had to have reality. Transparency and collaboration have contributed to the success of this massive environmental cleanup program. Under this framework for success, Oak Ridge has made major strides forward. At first, the emphasis was to gain control of the problem and to become compliant with federal environmental laws. My philosophy was to do the following. Fix the problems. Be proud of fixing those problems. And we also proved something else because people said, well, if you spend all that money for this or that, you can't meet your production and research requirements. Well, let me tell you, in all those years, we never missed a delivery on a weapon system or weapon component, and that included shipping to Pantex where they could be assembled into a full nuclear weapon. We never missed the teardown of returned weapons from stockpiles and inventories. Oak Ridge National Laboratory was able to meet up in the 90-something percentile of its research uh, targets, goals, if you will, but they were not held back by any environmental problems. And we never missed a delivery of enri enriched uranium to any of our commercial or military customers. By 1983, Oak Ridge was traveling to 10 states in Puerto Rico to work with local communities to clean up sites that had become contaminated as a result of early activities of the Atomic Energy Commission 
now known as DOE. In 1986, Oak Ridge was assigned the lead role for assisting DOE headquarters in meeting its obligation to manage hazardous waste and substances under RECRA and Superfund. The program was called the Hazardous Waste Remedial Action Program, better known as HAZRAP. From Oak Ridge, this program led the nation in developing and promoting an integrated approach to compliance. We laid a foundation for the program that carried on from that point in time. We laid a foundation for the work that is yet to be done, and there is work that is yet to be done. But what we did do was to step out, and when the day of reckoning came in 1989, we were able to step up and show we had not just a bunch of studies and books and this and that, but we had real cleanup projects. The reputation of Oak Ridge as a go-to place continued to extend beyond Oak Ridge to other environmental hotspots, such as Weldon Spring, which was located just west of St. Louis, Missouri. We had people come in from other offices and said, well, how did you do this? And we said, first of all, you work your tail off to earn trust, integrity, and credibility. A shutdown uranium ore processing facility had crumbled after more than 20 years of neglect. Nearby schools and communities were fearful that their water and air were polluted. Under Oak Ridge's leadership, DOE and its contractors moved to Weldon Spring and over the course of a decade managed to overcome the anger of literally thousands of people and close the circle on this plant. In Oak Ridge, decisions were being made and the successes were tangible. Capacity, discharge, and emission improvements were underway at Y12 and ORNL. Liquid from ponds was treated, then soil and sludge were removed and the areas were returned for beneficial use. New waste treatment capability included the Toxic Substances Control Act Incinerator, which began operations in 1991. This was a national asset and served the needs of the DOE for nearly 20 years as the only incinerator in the country that could destroy radioactively contaminated PCBs. This facility served the nation well, treating over 16,000 tons of hazardous and radioactive waste from the Oak Ridge Reservation and other DOE facilities before it was shut down in 2009. This was truly an example of Oak Ridge and the state of Tennessee being willing partners for managing waste from beyond their borders. Along with the MNO contractors being involved, we brought in small businesses. We brought in women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. We put together teams of Martin Marietta people with our people who worked with the regulators. And they met on a very regular basis. And then periodically, I and my counterparts in EPA and the state, we would meet with them in Atlanta or Nashville. Those were things that began to emerge into what we call the Oak Ridge model. In 1992, when the Federal Facilities Agreement between DOE, EPA, and Tennessee was signed, it solidified the already existing cooperation and participation that had, by that time, been growing for almost 10 years. Along with the help of Oak Ridge citizens groups, the DOE, the EPA, and the state were able to make major decisions for the cleanup of the Oak Ridge Reservation. Very proud to say that in this entire area, we probably have 99 out of 100 of the first. Nobody was running anywhere close to us by 1985, 1986, 1989 but people were committed to it and were dedicated. I've never had the privilege to work with a better workforce than what we have here in Oak Ridge. There's a lot at stake, not only in the form of jobs, but in the future and the quality of the life and the environment and the climate that we and their children and grandchildren will live in. Cleanup progress continued, and in 1995, Jim Hall became the new DOE operations office manager. At that time, DOE was faced with a limited budget for many priorities. Jim brought to the table a new and important tool for staying the course of cleanup progress. It was called reindustrialization. We were looking at about a billion dollars at least of uh, budget reductions over the coming years. 
So we had to try to find some way to um, find alternate employment. And you could only do that by uh, diversifying the economy of Oak Ridge. Reindustrialization in combination with the uh, environmental management contract uh, was to try to diversify the economy and try to find alternate employment for the thousands of people that were being laid off in Oak Ridge. It was a, certainly a change in, in attitude to try to convince people that you're not really looking at a government liability, you're looking at some tremendous business assets with those you know, land and buildings and equipment and things that could be used to beneficially for business purposes. And the first thing we did was to try to get companies interested in looking at what we had available at K-25. Kind of the first uh, opportunity we had was with uh, BNFL, British Nuclear Fuels, offered to take over three of the large process buildings, the gas fusion process buildings, and they would take, uh, they would clean them up, decontaminate them, take all the equipment out, the compressors, the converters, the piping, uh, everything. And, uh, and in exchange, we would negotiate some type of uh, monetary uh, payment to them, plus they could have all the metals in the building. And BNFL kind of became the uh, anchor tenant in reindustrialization. The Community Reuse Organization of East Tennessee, commonly known as CROAT, was formed in 1995. CROAT and its subsidiaries develop and manage underutilized DOE property. Today, numerous companies have located their business on the footprint of the former K-25 nuclear complex. I felt we, we did a lot of good, uh, and because we were very instrumental in national defense, and. Oak Ridge National Laboratory was, is just an incredible place that around every corner you go, there's something just really intriguing going on. The enormous success of this program to date now serves as a model for the Department of Energy's reindustrialization efforts across the nation. One day I was uh, in a conversation with Zach Wamp, uh, Congressman Wamp, and uh, he was representing that area at the time. And, and uh, we were talking about reindustrialization, and, and Zach commented that uh, K-25 was not a particularly attractive name for a for a uh, industrial park, and suggested that maybe we think about something else, another name. And so we talked about it and came up with uh, East Tennessee Technology Park as a more appropriate name. And uh, we socialized that name through some of the civic organizations and industrial development organizations in Oak Ridge and decided that we would do that, but <clears throat> I, I, I couldn't, I didn't know exactly how you change the name of a site that had been there for 50 years, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a regulation somewhere that tells you how to do these things, but I didn't really want to ask anybody because I thought, you know, I just might get the wrong answer. So I, I finally just called up uh, Bob Van Hook and Bob was the uh, president of uh, Lockheed Martin Energy Systems at that time, and said, Bob, I want you to take down all the K-25 signs and replace them with East Tennessee Technology Park. And uh, I expected Bob to kind of question me on that, you know, like, well, do you have authority to do this, or are you going to send me a letter authorizing this, or, hey, this has got a long tradition to it, are you sure you want to attack that and change the name. Uh, so I was expecting all of those questions, uh, but I only got one question from Bob, and that was, uh, is this reimbursable? ETTP is being transformed into a brownfield industrial park known as Heritage Center. The neighboring Horizon Center has been developed for companies that require a greenfield location. This thousand acre site offers opportunities for locating research and development, medical technology, manufacturing, distribution, and corporate headquarters. Today, high-tech facilities have already located to Horizon Center, and the vision for transformation has begun. When reindustrialization was initiated, and there was a, a vision for an industrial park uh, with Croat being the landlord and and having it totally off the DOE payroll, so there were no more DOE funds going into it, but lots of jobs created. Uh, it was a clean area with uh, 
uh, any high tech off uh, businesses and the whole gamut of businesses. Um, and so it's you know it's it's in a perfect location with the transportation of two interstates and there's barge capability and we're looking at the potential for an airport there so uh, I just view it as almost a, a a city and it's it's taken a little longer than we first envisioned we thought maybe 2010 we might get there turns out it may be 2020 before we get there but uh, with the people working on it uh, with the terrific work that Lawrence Young and Croet's doing, and uh, now they have Robert Brown on the Croet board, which is, uh, he was instrumental in, in making this whole thing happen to start with. Coupled with reindustrialization, the decontamination and decommissioning of ETTP began in earnest. Progress was real and tangible. Also important to the time was the arrival of Gerald Boyd to Oak Ridge. First, as DOE's manager of environmental management, and then, the Oak Ridge Operations Office Manager. I came to uh, Oak Ridge in 2002 and we started an accelerated uh, cleanup plan for the Oak Ridge Reservation. Um, really that accelerated cleanup plan was kind of the second phase in what I think is a three-phased uh, effort in Oak Ridge to get all the environmental uh, legacy dealt with. The first phase was clearly all around the reindustrialization effort that Jim Hall, Robert Brown led, and Rod Nelson was there in the EM program at the time. And then the second phase was really the, the accelerated uh, cleanup plan, the closure plan that we developed and approved in 2003. And its purpose was to try to accelerate D&D. &D. There was a lot of effort going on in soils and groundwater and decontamination of facilities and those kinds of things, but we wanted to take buildings down. So that plan was really to start to take down buildings, big buildings. And that's uh, basically what the plan uh, was designed to do. And we converted the contract that we had with Bechtel Jacobs at the time uh, to move from an m and &I type contract to a closure type contract. Before large buildings could be torn down, a location had to be available to dispose of the resulting debris. That need was met when the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility, located near Y-12 on the Oak Ridge Reservation, opened for business in 2002. And a haul road to connect ETTP to the facility was constructed in 2006. Accelerated cleanup began to take hold. Construction and operation of the Transuranic Waste Processing Center allowed the disposition of transuranic waste on the Oak Ridge Reservation to begin. Workers completed demolition of many legacy buildings at ETTP. Other work included remediation of Blair Quarry, stabilization of the Melton Valley burial grounds, and removal of nearly 7,000 cylinders of depleted uranium hexafluoride. As work on the reservation continued, off-site properties, including the David Witherspoon site in Knoxville and the Atomic City Auto Parts site in Oak Ridge, were cleaned up and made ready for reuse. Oak Ridge uh, contractors, the Oak Ridge uh, DOE management, had known for a long time that there were a lot of facilities, a lot of contamination at the lab and at Y-12 that had never been put into the EM program. Part of it had, some of it had been baseline, there was some work going on, but mostly S&M. Uh, there was not a, a large effort uh, aimed at uh, the millions of curies of radioactivity inside the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the hundreds of thousands of square feet of contaminated space uh, at the Y-12 plant. So I think everybody had known for a long time that we, we need to do something about this, but it kept getting pushed further and further away. And we had an event 
uh, on July the 4th, 2002, which I remember very well, it was a release of strontium uh, from one of our stacks in the central campus. And the result of that was we contaminated a parking lot and some buildings, and the parking lot was full of cars, lots of them. And we had to then decontaminate the cars, uh, do decontamination of the surrounding area. Took a little bit of effort. Uh, it was kind of a wake-up call, I think, to everybody that we really cannot any longer uh, ignore that we don't have uh, uh, a plan for dealing with this. In addition to continuing the D&D &D of deteriorating facilities at ETTP, there was a renewed focus on the risks at the lab and Y-12. This was phase three of the plan for the Oak Ridge Reservation. The third phase of that, to me, is what we have referred to as IFDP, which is the uh, Integrated Facility Disposition Project, which takes into account the central campus of the laboratory uh, and the Y-12 Valley, which was not in the original baseline or the original FFA for, for Oak Ridge. It's probably laid out like it ought to be. Unfortunately, it's not funded adequately. So that was sort of the genesis of it. It had been there for a long time. We all knew that something had to be done, but it took a trigger event, I think, that caused us to wake up and pay attention to it. DOE in Washington established the authority for IFDP with the approval of critical decisions known as CD0 and CD1. Then the country went into a recession. The President and Congress infused billions of dollars into the economy through the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. And as a result of Recovery Act, we were able to get about $800 million above and beyond our normal budget. That got us started both in Y-12 and at the laboratory, doing some pretty critical work. Had it not been for the Recovery Act money, uh, we would still not be moving forward on that project because of budget. With the Recovery Act as the funding source and IFDP as the roadmap, Oak Ridge made progress that would otherwise have been impossible. The lab's focus was on acceleration of transuranic waste processing and demolition of mothballed facilities in the central campus, including hot cells, removal of tank W1A, at Y-12, the clean-out of former production facilities was completed. Much of the biology complex was demolished, and contaminated scrap metal on the ground was removed. At ETTP, Recovery Act funding made it possible to demolish Building K-33, a significant accomplishment. What has gone before often shapes what the future will be. And that is very true with the cleanup program that has been conducted in Oak Ridge for the last 30 years. Environmental cleanup is an essential part of making our way from the past to the future. I see a bright future for reindustrialization and for East Tennessee Technology Park. And I think they'll get there with a, a, a very vibrant and robust uh, business community. There is a connection between the science and the advanced manufacturing that goes on in Oak Ridge, the cleanup that needs to be done there, needs to be finished there, and then technology transfer and commercialization out into the private sector for economic development reasons. And I see a real pathway forward uh, for Oak Ridge in that arena, but we have to stay the course to make sure that we finish the environmental mission there. My hope is that the people working in this program today retain that vision of we're going to the top of the mountain. And what is that? A cleaned up Oak Ridge. One cleanup success leads to the next, which leads to the next and the next. And the result will ultimately be the completion of cleanup in Oak Ridge. That is the legacy we leave to our children and their children for generations to come.